Uh, so thanks so much for having me here. I'm, um, I used to actually come from this part of the country, so I love always when I get to come back to California. And um, so I think that what I'm hoping you're gonna take away from this is this idea of optimism. I am an optimist myself. I thought it was great that I got to follow the panel on hope. And um, the only disclaimer that I wanna make though is um, I'm not sure if everything I'm gonna tell you is right. <laughs> so this is definitely probably a little bit more faith than science but let's give it a shot. So, um, so I'm from the Framingham Heart Study. So just to start, as a reminder, Framingham started in 1948. And these are actual pictures from Framingham in those days. And as you probably, many of you might know, it started out as a, a study of heart disease and stroke. So actually, I'm just curious, how many people have heard of Framingham? So you a lot have. And for those of you who haven't, uh, here's how Framingham has impacted your life. If you've ever gone to the doctors and you've had your blood pressure measured, that's because of Framingham. Framingham is the first study to define the concept of high blood pressure. In fact, Framingham was the first study to define the concept of risk factors. So it really opened up sort of the whole field of preventive medicine, which I think is really what we're focused on for the remainder of today, is this concept of prevention. So my part of Framingham, though, is that it turns out what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. So I came into Framingham in 1990 to take all this great data and start to look at it related to Alzheimer's disease. But when I first came to Framingham, what really struck me as I started to test our elderly participants is how anxious they were about our testing. And I really, really worried about the fact, was I really capturing their cognitive capabilities? Um, through our, these different tests. And then what happened is, is as we moved into our multi-ethnic cohort, I became even more concerned because many of our neuropsychological tests are actually developed with native speakers of English in mind. So it turns out that this problem that I've been facing at Framingham is one that we have throughout the US. Because of our very diverse population, you know, the, the, the question is, are our cognitive tools actually set up to be able to pick up the kinds of cognitive functions in an accurate way that we really want them to? And it turns out that this problem isn't limited to here in the US. Because as I moved my work to other parts of the world, it turns out that the issue of being able to assess cognitive function accurately, regardless of your country, your language, et cetera, was very, very, much an issue. And it turns out that it's an issue worldwide. So right now, the, the world is aging. We now have, for the first time ever, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. And there are other parts of the world where the issue of things like Alzheimer's disease are much greater than they are even here. So here's really the situation that's confronting me. So this is the theoretical curve of how the progression of Alzheimer's disease moves. Um, and you, we've heard a lot during the uh, earlier part of the day about the different kinds of biomarkers. Now, I'm just going to remind you, I'm a neuropsychologist. So my part of the, this whole um, endeavor is really, um, doesn't really become really relevant until we're getting pretty close to disease. And the question is, is how can I actually figure out how to detect uh, cognitive changes much earlier on? So that's really the challenge that was in front of me. So because this is about digital, I'm gonna focus on the work that we've been doing at Framingham that's very specific to digital technologies. So just to start with, I want you just to listen. Nine, two, six. Nine, two, six. All right, so this is a participant who took our exam twice. The very first time, we decided that they were not cognitively impaired, but the second time around, we determined that they were starting to have mild cognitive impairment. Now, think about, though, the response, 926. That was the identical response both times, right? Well, it turns out that response was correct. 
So if we take traditional neuropsych testing, which is just to look for your correct responses, we would have said this person is fine. But I think when you were listening, you could hear the difference. You could hear the pauses and hesitations, right? So it turns out since 2005, we've been digitally recording people's spoken responses to neuropsych tests. And we have acquired now over 9,500 of these recordings, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a little preview of some of our analyses of these. We took about 200 of these recordings. We had to transcribe them, it's just laborious work. And then we decided to subject it to machine learning algorithms by analyzing these voice recordings. And what we were able to determine is, is that we could actually, on the basis of these voice markers, start to differentiate between people who are demented and not demented. And including um, somewhat between people who are demented and those that were um, uh, cognitively impaired, mildly cognitively impaired. So what this really gave root to is this idea of a digital voice biomarker that could maybe detect changes much earlier on than our normal cognitive tests would do it. So along those lines, in 2011, we substituted a regular pen for a digital pen. So what's really important is we don't change the tests themselves, we just change the tools in which we're measuring the response. So I think what you can see here, and if you look along the bottom of the line, you can see all those different color codings, that's actually detecting the changes in velocity as someone moves from one item to the next. So what we're able to do now is pick up really granular changes of behavior, again, giving us a window into the brain as people are actually doing it. So we've done a little bit of analyses on this as well. Um, this is work that I've done with the MIT and Leahy Group. And we were able to take sort of these um, various digital markers, measures, of which, by the way, from a, a clock drawing test, two minute test, we can, get, we can extract over 1,000 metrics from that. So we subject that to some um, machine learning. And what you just need to point it, it uh, to take a look at is what's in, in the red, circled in the red, that's actually what our machine learning algorithms are able to do in terms of detecting de uh, differences between different clinical groups. So we at Framingham decided to take it another step further because really the challenge is trying to, to, trying to detect changes much earlier on. That's what Dr. Jagus talked about earlier today, is that we really need to go into where you're cognitively intact. And we actually did that. With the digital clock drawing test, we took people from Framingham, none of them who had any signs of dementia or stroke, and um, pretty highly educated, and we looked at some of our digital cognitive, uh, uh, digital clock drawing measures, and these are a number of different ones that we picked out. And what's the important thing to, to note from our results is that across the two conditions, there's a command condition and a copy condition, across our command condition, we can actually detect differences between different age groups. Now think about this. These are all people, if you were to look at their actual performance on this test, you would have said they look normal. But in fact, we can now start to dif differentiate some changes in their uh, capabilities, and that's the same thing with the copy condition as well. So this is sort of the first foray that we, that we had into really thinking about the power that digital technologies will allow us to do as we try to tr uh, um, attack this problem of detection. So currently at Framingham, we have a new study that we're trying to launch, and this is a PET study where we're going to uh, scan people, both with a PET amyloid and uh, tau scans, but at the same time, we're going to give them these tests and, and record them digitally. And the goal here is actually to figure out, can we find digital measures that correlate highly with PET amyloid and or tau pathology? So what will that allow us to do? What that will allow us to do suddenly is potentially screen lots of different people for potential risk of Alzheimer's disease. Because think about it. Think about how expensive a PET scan is. Think about how difficult it is now if you want to go into a large population, a largely normal population, and you want to screen them. So it's not actually feasible to do this through imaging but you can do it through digital technologies. So that's really sort of the purpose of where we're headed. So at Framingham today, 
we have an 80 precision uh, medicine approach where we're taking these really novel phenotypes and we're pairing it with all our other data that we've been collecting from our participants, which includes blood-based biomarker, we have imaging, we actually have some autopsy cases, although not nearly as many as Dr. Schneider. And then we're, um, we're uh, bringing in very advanced analytics in order to analyze this. So Framingham today, I think of as being a really rich data resource that's really driving um, Alzheimer's disease drug discovery uh, possibilities. But the question is, where do we go from here? So we've spent a lot of time talking about the issue of cognitive impairment. But where I think the really transformative opportunities are is actually for us to start thinking about cognitive health. So we've touched about this a little bit already. When we have been now increasingly realizing that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are actually life course diseases. So it's not something that we should be paying attention to later in life. We may need to be paying attention to this across our entire life. And uh, so let's go back to this situation. Again, this is where we think about cognition in terms of the um, trajectory of the disease. What I think will be possible with digital technologies is actually to move our detection much earlier on, well within when people are normal. And I think that if we are able to do that, the impact is going to be significant. We already know that if we can delay people's onset of disease by five years, we can cut their risk by nearly 50%. But I think that actually if we detect it earlier, and we intervene early enough, we're gonna change the trajectory altogether and prevent disease. So that's really where I think the real possibilities lie in the future. So I'm just gonna remind you, we already know this, Alzheimer's disease, it's insidious and onset. When you're diagnosed, it's not like the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, or even five years before you were normal. You've been on this trajectory for a really long time. So the question is, can we, through the use of digital technologies, start to pick up those much earlier on and really intervene when we see that first negative trajectory of change emerge well within, when you're still within the normal ranges? So to that end, we've been developing a brain health monitoring platform that really sort of takes advantage of what digital technologies may allow today. So in implementing this, the first thing we do is we do what we've always done. We have to continue collecting the data in the clinic the way we traditionally have done. The only thing that I suggest that everybody think about doing in their work is think about acquiring it digitally. So that's exactly what we did with our neuropsych tests. We've been giving some of these neuropsychology tests at Framingham since 1976. And it turns out you can never change anything at Framingham once you start doing it. So, so the challenge is, as the field's moving ahead, how do I make these instruments more sensitive when I'm not even allowed to change them? Well, it turns out by just adding digital recording, capturing with the digital pen allows me to do that. And we can do this across lots of different health metrics. And so once you collect it in the clinic, you have the gold standard measures, and then you have the digital on top of that so that you can match and validate the two together. And then that allows you to then start thinking about how to do the data collection outside of the clinic and allow you to do this on a much more frequent, ongoing basis. Because right now, when we do data collection, it's very sporadic, and there's large time gaps in between. So with active um, technology, active engagement technology, we can actually collect this data in people's natural environment. So that's what we've started to do at Boston University, is we've been taking this platform and we've been uh, deploying it across lots of different uh, populations. So this really opens up for us this concept of digital biomarkers. So I have to tell you, I started using the term digital biomarkers probably about seven, eight years ago. And at the time when I first started using it, people told me I'm not allowed to use it. That biomarkers are supposed to have a biological base, that I'm not allowed to put those two words together. And I'm like, well, could you just work with me? Can we just think about this conceptually? But it turns out 
that the FDA had started to think about this as well. And so in their own interest in terms of where digital health can take us, uh, they published in their action plan the concept of digital biomarkers, which allows me now to use it much more freely, which is what I do. So here we are. This is what I think we can do. And what I want you to think about is when we think about biomarkers, we tend to think about something that's diagnostic. But if so, on the one hand, we, always, we, we could certainly increase potentially diagnosis of this disease much earlier on. But now the issue is, if we catch this early enough in the course of the insidious onset, at one point do they stop being diagnostic and start being prognostic? So along those lines, this is where we're going next. This is what we're doing. We're actually taking different digital technologies, integrating them together in order to create a, a deployable system that could be um, deployed at scale, large populations of people, in order to allow us to start monitoring these important behaviors on an ongoing basis. What's important for me to point out here is not so much the specific technologies that are listed here, but the fact that you have to have multiple technologies. There is never gonna be one solution, there's never gonna be one technology. It's really an ecosystem that you have to bring together and you have to do it on an ongoing basis. And what we're doing is we're starting to test this then platform across a lot of different um, diverse cohorts. Um, but the other thing that I really want the field in general to start thinking about is this idea of how can we do more? How can we actually deploy across many different groups that we don't traditionally think about? So let's go back to the lesson of Framingham. Framingham started out as a study of heart disease and stroke, but I would say today it's probably one of the most valuable resources for looking at brain aging, and particularly in the, um, in the era of Alzheimer's disease. And so today, we think about the fact that vascular risk is a real significant risk factor for increased risk for Alzheimer's, right? Well, we know that because studies like Framingham collected a lot of this kind of data. And it turns out that there's lots of different things. There's a lot of different factors that affect the brain. And we're, we don't know what all those things are. So here's one of the things that I worry about all the time. Why is it, until recently, we have not had any disease-modifying drugs that seem effective, right? I would say it's because, turns out, us in the AD research world, we're all collecting the same data. We have to, we have to get through peer review. And so consequently, we all collect APOE, we collect imaging, we collect cognition, et cetera. So here's the thing. Not shockingly, we're finding all the same things. If we're really going to drive true innovation and discovery related to the disease, we have to go outside the disease in order to understand the disease itself. So in that sense, I'm moving on and, move, and looking at other cohort studies that are outside the AD world and bringing this brain aging component, because now I have a deployable, technologically deployable solution to go out and measure brain aging components that I can add onto other cohorts. Another big cohort that I'm working with, oops, sorry about that, is the Black Women's Health Study. That's a 20-year longitudinal study on black women, 59,000 across the country. Be really hard to bring them all in for a clinic exam, but with the Brain Health Monitoring Platform, I can deploy that at scale. So here's what we're trying to do. What we really want to do is start to aggregate. So uh, earlier, we talked about the importance of sharing. This is all about data sharing. It's about bringing all the different data from all the different diverse cohorts and aggregating it into a data sharing platform. And the reason this is going to be really important is because this is how we're going to discover digital biomarkers, OK? Because right now, the concept of digital biomarkers is just that. We, it, it's an idea in order to get to the point where we actually start to discover what they are means that we're gonna to have to share this data. This is gonna be an artificial intelligence data science driven solution and we're gonna to have to um, share it with that community in order to, to uh, develop these discoveries. 
Why is it that we have to do it that way? This is what I want to remind everybody. Data science and artificial intelligence right now, hardest, hottest field in the world. If you have a degree in that field, they just eat you up, right? Everybody wants to hire you. So it turns out in academics, we train them and then we lose them. And here's why we lose them. Because we underpay, we overwork, and we give no job security. So you've got the hottest job skills in the world. You don't stay in an academic environment. You go elsewhere. And so we need to get that data to them wherever they sit. And that's why we have to do this in a data sharing way. And then how are we going to accelerate our discovery of digital biomarkers? We're going to keep aggregating the data, and we're going to keep sharing it. And we're going to keep sharing it and sharing it and sharing it. And I think collectively, we will then start to uh, identify what these digital biomarkers are and really reach the sort of the true capacity of what digital allows us to do. So one of the things I would like to point out is that to do this kind of work means to step outside your comfort zone. So one of the things that we do is we work with anybody. We work with technology companies, big companies, small companies, startup companies, investment groups. Uh, I work with academic partners wherever they sit. Work, we work outside of the US. So I see a world of no boundaries as to who our collaborators are out there. We always are talking to more people. I, I have lots of people that I'm always talking to, and we're always looking for more. Uh, because the challenge is really big, and nobody, no one group is going to solve it. So my solution is let's just try to solve it all together. So the question is, where next? So I've talked a lot about you know, the possibility of what digital technologies can do to help us solve this problem, which is really one that faces the more old, older part of our population. So here's something to keep in mind. It turns out that the greatest consumers of healthcare products and services are the elderly. But it's also the case that the lowest consumers of new technologies are the elderly. So, So, so the issue here is you can build it, but they may not use it. So the question is, how do you really monitor behaviors on a continuous basis with digital technologies? What we have to do is we have to get to ambient technologies. These are the technologies that collect the data in the background passively as you engage in your environment. This is where we need to go. Um, and this is still relatively new because most health technologies are built with a patient in mind. And a patient is already pretty incentivized to go and, um, and interact, engage, and figure out these different technologies. But your average person who isn't showing any symptoms, they have far less incentive to continue to do that. So that's really where we have to head, and this is what we need to do. We need to stop thinking about this in terms of disease, and we need to start thinking about this as a precision brain health initiative. This is really about what can we do across your entire lifespan, not just waiting until you're older, but across your entire lifespan to optimize your brain health. And if we're monitoring on an ongoing basis, and we're intervening on an ongoing basis, that's how we're going to get to that trajectory that prevents disease altogether. So this is sort of my vision of where we need to go. And here's what I think will be the impact. So first of all, let's go back to my original problem. My original problem is, is how do I assess cognition accurately? And I think that digital technologies are going to give me a solution. I think that with di digital technologies, if I can start to monitor people's natural behaviors in their environment as they engage in their environment, I think that instead of testing cognition, we're going to be able to infer cognition. And why is that? Because it turns out that everything we do, we do through our brain. So as we interact socially, physical activity, taking our medication, et cetera, we're always reflecting our cognitive capabilities, right? If you think about it, that's what subjective complaint is about. 
subjective complaint or when you know you have an intake of a new patient, one of the things you first things you do is you ask the family member, when did you start to notice? Last time check, most family members aren't sitting around giving their loved ones a cognitive test, right? They're just noticing their normal behaviors, their interaction. And I think that we'll be able to do that with the, with the help of these technologies. The other big thing I think we, could, we will be able to do is we're, we're finally gonna be able to achieve representativeness. We talk a lot about the need to do it, but we don't actually do it. And so I want to go back to this concept of digital voice. And I want you to think about that. You know, turns out that regardless of your education, regardless of where you live, regardless of um, your culture, most people speak. So now if suddenly you have a tool that is ubiquitous, that's so easy to collect, very low cost, right? Suddenly you have an opportunity where we can, we can start to assess people wherever they are. I worry a lot about this because I do work in China. And here's a fact. China, which is the most rapidly aging population, largest rapidly aging population in the world, they have no PhD programs in neuropsychology, none. In fact, there are not many PhD programs in neuropsychology once you get outside of the US and Western Europe. So I told you, aging, global problem, right? Dementia, a global problem. How are we gonna, how are we gonna solve this? Technology is gonna allow us to achieve these uh, objectives. And then I think that we have an opportunity then to take the lessons we learn here and then go and share them globally to our um, fellow uh, countries who don't have quite the resources that we have. The other thing that I think will emerge out of this is obviously new healthcare solutions. We'll be able to intervene much earlier on. We'll be able to have therapies uh, um, um, brought in much earlier in the process, and I think that that's all gonna drive us toward much greater success than we have seen before. I also think that there are a lot of new business opportunities. So in addition to this idea of now opening up this realm of digital biomarkers, I think there's lots of technological solutions that can be developed, not just on the detection side, I think on the intervention side as well. And I think that that's really important because as much as we have lots of services, we don't have enough. And we certainly don't have enough worldwide. So if we can find automated solutions that allow us to bridge the gap between the high touch that we need in terms of personal interaction, if we can find ways to use technology to bridge those gaps, then I think, um, then I think that those are some good opportunities um, that can scale. So what's gonna be the overall impact of this success? I will actually tell you, I think this is the solution for finally solving our problem of um, reducing our healthcare costs and increasing our health quality. Why is that? Because it turns out in the US, 86% of our diseases are chronic diseases. So by nature, most of them are insidious and onset. So the reason our healthcare costs are so high in this country is because we're really good, we wait until your symptoms hit a certain level, and then we treat it then. And because they're chronic, we just keep treating it for a really long time. We're very good at keeping ourselves alive for a really long time, but that's why our costs never go down. So if we can start to create these preventive strategies, that's exactly how we'll, we'll be able to achieve these and solve this dichotomy. So for me, um, as I move forward, and what I'd like to encourage all of you to think about is that uh, is really this idea of thinking differently, of really re-examining sort of what we've been doing and how we've been doing it, and then thinking about how to do it in a different way. But one of the things that I wanted to um, note is that this is like really, really easy for me to get up here and talk to you about and share this with you. And it turns out that when you try to do something that's really different, that's really trying to change things in a very uh, paradigm shifting way, it turns out that it's really hard to do. So the other um, piece of advice that I would wanna leave you with is when you think you're looking at the impossible, the goal <laughs> is you never give up, all right? And that's it. Thank you very much.